Visitors here also. Right. <laughs> In the world we're visitors, right? Right. <laughs> dedicate the, the Shir tonight for the Yeshua of all of Kla Yisrael mm-hmm. and the frat, all those that need it, especially Yaakov Naftali ben Rochel Dvoira, Gilad Michoel ben Basgalim, Ayal ben Iris Tishura. Amen. Amen. And, and all the Jews that are in captivity, that they need to be freed. <coughs> a lot of Jews that are in Amen. captivity, the Gashmias, and a lot of Jews that are in captivity, the Ruchmias, that are, that are being held captive. We make a brach every morning, Matir Asurim. Who are the Asurim? That's us. We're, we're referring to us. That we're, we're tied up in knots. The Yitzhahara ties us up sometimes in different ways and doesn't let us get to what, doesn't let us get, get out to Hashem, to get out, get out to what we need to get to. One of the great Breslov Hasidim of the previous generation, his name was Reb Tzviarye Lippel, Zichrein of Racha. He was one of those who was known that when he, when he said Sfira Soimer, he put his whole heart into it in a very big way. And one time, <coughs> somebody observed him saying one of the chapters that we say after we count the Oimer, Ona B'choyach. And in there, two of the words that we say there are Tatir Tzerura. Tatir Tzerura. Hashem should untie the, 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 the bundles. And he kept going on that for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, over an hour. Couldn't get off of those words. And somebody asked him afterwards, what, what, were, you, what were you thinking? You know, when you sing these words, Tatir Tzerura. And he said, I was thinking about how the Yitzhahara ties me up in knots. All kinds of different knots. My hands, my feet, my brain, every part of me not allowing me to reach out, not allowing me to reach out to Hashem, to reach out to where I need to reach out to. And in, in saying those words, begging Hashem to release me, to, to release me from the imprisonment that we're in. So by us, when we make that bracha every single day, Matar Asurim, number one, we're referring to ourselves. In addition, we're referring to all the Jews that are, that are, that are being held captive by the, the Gashmias and Baruchnias. <coughs> Hashem should help. There are thousands of people that are davening. There are thousands of people that are crying. We know that there's a combination that's needed. Rabbi Nezal, one of the incredible revelations that Rabbi Nachman gave to Klal Yisrael was the, the realization that it's only if one combines both Torah and Tefillah that a person can achieve everything they want to achieve. Baruch Niyas in the in the Shira Sayam, <coughs> one of the sentences there we say Ozi Vizimrasko Vayahili Lishua. Those words Vayahili Lishua that uh, will be to me a salvation. Which person wouldn't want to know the secret of how you could be sure that you're gonna have the salvation? What's the secret? The secret is dependent on two things. Ozi Oz is one of the terms that's used to define the Torah. Hashem oiz lamo itein, Hashem yevorech esam oiz asholim. That Hashem gave us the Torah, which is called oiz. Ozi, if a person has Torah, the zimra sko, and the song of Hashem, and sings the praises of Hashem, tefillah, vayihili Yeshua. That's something that's guaranteed to bring about the Yeshua that the person needs, because that's covering all sides, all sides of the equation, mm-hmm. from top to bottom, from Chachma to Malchus, all the different, the, the different pieces that need to be covered. <coughs> One of the things that we've been, I've been learning about recently with friends of mine that are learning Likut HaLochas together is the topic of Rotzain, desire. Desire, willpower, which is a term that's used in the Torah, in many different places, to mean several different things. We know that the Sfarim that define why Hashem created the world, many of those Sfarim begin with the words, Beret Sinai. It was the will of Hashem, such and such, and go into a whole long explanation as to what, what the will of Hashem was. It was the will of Hashem to want to share His Chesed, to want to have upon whom to bestow his chesed. It was the will of Hashem 
to have his Malchus, his kingdom, accepted all, all under that term, Biret Sinai. It was the, the will of Hashem, the will of Hashem, the desire of Hashem. The, t- the same term is used for both, R- will, desire. The same term is used also to refer to being appeased. When somebody is angry, very upset about something, and then we're able to turn that anger around <coughs> to appeasement, that's also called Hurotzayim. We say the korbanos that we bring, all the different sacrifices that were brought in the Beis Hamikdash, Lerotzayim Lefnei Hashem, that this should serve as an appeasement. All the different things that we might have done in, in thought, speech, and action to anger Hashem, to cause Hashem to be unhappy, dissatisfied, displeased with us, the purpose of these korbanos and tefillos and mitzvahs is to, to switch that around. And, and we say this in our tefillah, we say, Beroiges rachim tizkor. That Hashem, when you're angry at us, Beroiges, when Hashem, re- remember your kindness. Remember your kindness. This is this, this term, Rotzin. This is one of, the, one of the things that's elaborated on the most throughout Rabbi Nezal's teachings. Tremendous, tremendous emphasis on clarifying what is Hashem's will, what does Hashem really want? What does Hashem want from us? How can we achieve it? And how can we achieve it best? Well, just because of the fact that time-wise now, we just, today's Sunday, yesterday we read Parsha Shlach, and, and we also read Parsha Korach on Shabbos. During, in the morning we read a Parsha, a certain Parsha, at Mincha, we read the parsha of the upcoming week. Just using these two parshas as an example to really clarify for us what our mission is and, and what the difficulty, the obstacles are, and how to, how to address it correctly. When Hashem spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu about taking the Jews out of Mitzrayim, there were a few statements that Hashem made. Hashem said, number one, that when you leave Egypt, you're going to serve Hashem on this mountain, on Har Sinai. Hashem also said, I'm taking you out of Mitzrayim in order to bring you to Eretz Yisrael. And this, this, the Shoah Kodesh, in one place, asks an incredible question. He says, when the Jews were standing at Kriyas Yamsuf, and they cried out to Hashem, the Torah says, they Hashem, and Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, Ma titzak elai, why are they screaming? The Shalak says, what kind of a ridiculous question is that? Isn't this what we were taught by our forefathers? Isn't, isn't this what we know a Jew is supposed to do in a case of emergency? To scream to Hashem, what is that saying? And he explains that when a human being says they're going to do something that, that begins at one point and finishes at another point, number one, we don't know if that's their real intention, if, if they're saying what they mean or they mean what they say. Number two, even if they do mean it, sometimes people could want to do certain things and don't necessarily get to complete it. But if Hashem says he's going to do something, if Hashem says, I'm taking you out of here in order to bring you to here, there shouldn't be any, and Hashem starts the mission already, there shouldn't have been any doubt in, their, in our minds whatsoever that Hashem can and will complete it. It doesn't say, why are you davening? Because Tefillah, the Shalak Kodesh says, even if Hashem says he's going to do something, we are expected to follow through with tefillah till the end, to keep davening. The Torah says that Yaakov Avinu was afraid. Who knows? Maybe I did something or maybe I'll do something to become unworthy along the way. So to accompany it with tefillah, definitely. But the desperation that Sa'oka implies that, oi, what's going to be? Emerges, what's going to be? They saw the Egyptians chasing them. They saw the sea. They saw the snakes and scorpions. That, that was a display of lack of trust in Hashem. The, the crying out, the screaming there, 
didn't apply confidence in Hashem. It was, it was a reflection of lack of trust, lack of confidence that, that Hashem is going to pull this off. That was the mistake. Hashem said to Moshe Rabbeinu, to Bnei Yisrael, that I'm taking you out of Mitzrayim, out of slavery, slavery to bring you to a wonderful place. Eretz, Toiva, all the, 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 the Torah throughout praises Eretz Yisrael tremendously. The Torah tells us that the Jews displayed a lack of trust, a lack of confidence in Hashem, when they said, Nishlecha Anoshim Lefaneinu, that before we go, before we make a full commitment of sending 600,000 men there, plus women, plus children, millions of people, we're going to do what any normal person, what any rational person would do. We're going to send people to, to check out the situation. This, this, this suggestion was a display of lack of trust in Hashem. What, do you, what is there to check out? Hashem said it's good, Hashem said go. There's, what more is needed? So the, the parsha begins with Hashem saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, Shlach Lecha. And Rashi HaKadosh says, Ledaitcha. This is, you, you're doing this on, with your own das. Ani Eini Metzave Lecha. I'm not instructing you to do this. This is not coming from me. Im tirze, if you want, send. And this is an incredible, if a person can, can listen carefully now, our Sfarim clarify for us exactly, exactly what our test is and, and how, to, how to pass the test that we have on a daily basis. Hashem wants us to succeed. The Gemara says, Ein HaKadosh Baruch Hu Betrunyam Hashem doesn't want us to fail. He wants us to succeed. Therefore, when Hashem expresses what His expectations are from us, what He wants us to do, He's definitely going to give us something that we're capable of doing. However, however, He's going to put it, present it to us in a way where we have a choice. We can choose to, to do, to comply. We can choose to go against. Here the Torah says, Hashem made it perfectly at Tomoshu Rabbeinu, Shlach Lecha. That this is something you're sending Ledaitcha. It's, uh, you're, you're on your own on this. This is not coming from me at all. Im Tirtze, if you want, send them. There's a story in Sipuri Maisius one of the shortest, most powerful stories that Rabbi Nezal told, where it speaks about a, a rabbi who had an only child, didn't have children for many years, finally had a son, and you could imagine the love that he had for this son, and the son, he raises the son to become a Talmud Chacham, to learn Torah, be religious, everything, and the son is doing his best to study and at one point he starts feeling that, that something is missing. A person learns Torah, the Torah tells us what a person is supposed to feel, what a person is supposed to experience when they're learning Torah. The paths of the Torah are sweet, it's sweet, it's special, it, it injects a person. The, the Mishnah says in Perki Yavas, a person who learns Torah properly, it gives them every good character trait imaginable. Humility, respect, respect for others. It makes the person liked by everybody they come into contact with, etc. And this young man saw that it, it wasn't happening to him. He saw something was missing in a big way, and he spoke to friends, and they advised him to go to a specific tzaddik, and, and you'll be helped. You'll get the solution to your problem. He approaches his father, telling his father the problem, that he's learning the, the, to the best of his ability. He's davening, he's doing the mitzvahs, but he feels something major that's lacking in all of it. 
he doesn't feel any, any pleasure in it, he doesn't feel any chiyas, any life in it. And he's thinking, he, he's, he wants to go see this particular tzaddik. The father immediately responds, saying, ridiculous. You're, you're much more learned than him. You're smarter than him. And you come from a better family background than him. It would be an insult to you and to me for, for us to go to see him. Forget this completely. And the father's pretty strong in his, in his conviction. And the, the son has respect for his father, who's a rov. So he steps away. He lets it go. But he still feels this tremendous lack. And then a period of time goes by, approaches his friends again. They tell him the same advice. Goes back to his father. His father again talks him out of it. And this happens repeatedly. And the story continues until finally the son is so insistent that the father has to accompany him. But the father says, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you that he's nothing, that this is nothing. That's the attitude that he went with. You know, predetermined decision already that he's nothing. The father. The father, the rov. And he says, you know what, let's make a test. We'll see. If we see everything goes smooth, then we know that Hashem wants us to, to, to go. If we see things go wrong, it'll be Hashem's way of communicating to us that this is something we shouldn't be doing. They, they go out, they, they make the trip, things go wrong immediately. The father says, you see, you see, let's go back home. They go back home. Same problem persists, the sun pressures again. They go a second time. Again, we're gonna do a test, again, failed. Third time, the son says, you know what? None of these, this, this testing business is not, not good for us. Unless we see a real clear, because the things that happened, the, the, the wagon tipped over and we almost drowned, or both axles broke, such things do, it, it happens, it could happen. Unless we see a real clear sign, a real clear sign from Hashem, that Hashem doesn't want us to go, we're going all the way this time. And they set out on the trip and they go and they get to a certain an inn and there they, the, the rabbi doesn't want anybody to know where he's going. He's embarrassed, he's ashamed for anybody to find out that he's going to this tzaddik. Why would he be ashamed? Because we know that in, in different generations at times when a person went to a particular tzaddik they were ridiculed for it. What kind of tzaddikim? Moshe Rabbeinu, this week's Pasha. Korach is laughing. He's laughing. Mitlot says, late sonos. He's making fun. He's mocking Moshe Rabbeinu in front of 250 rabbis, and nobody has something to say to defend Moshe Rabbeinu. They're all listening. They're listening. They're enjoying it. So here also, <coughs> this rabbi went with that kind of attitude. And sure enough, they meet somebody there and they mention that the tzaddik is mentioned. And this person says, tzaddik? He's not a tzaddik. I was just there and I saw him commit a sin, you know. And then the story continues. <clears throat> the son dies. The son comes to the father in a dream with tremendous anger. And the father figures, dreams are nonsense. Dreams are, dreams are false. The dream occurs three times in a row. And the, father, the son says, if the father asks the son, why are you so angry at me? The son says to the father, go to that tzaddik, you'll find out why I'm so angry at you. <clears throat> the father sets out, he goes, and he meets, he meets the person who he had met earlier, who made fun of the tzaddik, who told him that tzaddik is a nobody. And this person looks at him, and he says, aren't you, didn't I meet you here before, when I was here a while ago? He says, yes, definitely. And then the person says to him, you want me to swallow you? Do you want me to, to swallow you? So the rabbi looks at him. What kind of thing is that to say to a human being? You want me to swallow you? Are you crazy? And he goes on to say, I was the one. I was the one who saw to it that your wagon tipped over. I was the one who saw to it that the axles broke. And now that I succeeded in, in, this, in preventing your son from getting to that tzaddik, if your son had gotten to that tzaddik, these two represented an incredible power of holiness, which if they would get together, it could have brought the end for Klal Yisrael. It could have brought Mashiach, the whole Gula. Now that I succeeded in blocking him, if you go, it's not that big a deal.
the, the commentaries in explaining the story mention this expression, im terze, if you want, you, you, do you, you want me to swallow you? And they comment that on one hand it's a strange statement, and yet that's how people talk sometimes. Sometimes people get into a conflict and somebody say, you want me to hit you? You want me to beat you up? And they ask, which normal person? You know, why would somebody ask that question? Are you expecting the other person to say, yes, yes, I want you to, yes, I want you to beat me up? So why do people say that? And he answers that you should know that there's a rule in Yiddishkeit that the Yetzirah cannot, cannot get a person to commit a sin or to do anything unless the person is willing unless the person expresses an interest, shows some interest in the offer that the Yetzirah is offering. If a person says, a person comes to you, they knock on your door, we're selling books, we're selling vacuum cleaners, the woman says, no, no. But, uh, no. If the person can stand their ground and say no solidly enough and persistently enough, game over. If the person exp shows the slightest degree of interest, it's like a fish. You can have a, a, a three, four hundred pound fish, and you have a person, you have a little boy, a boy or a young man in, in a ship who weighs 150 pounds, 130 pounds, and he's holding the fishing rod, and he wants to reel in this three, four hundred pound fish. <clears throat> and he puts this little tiny worm at the end of the thing, or something like that, a little thing of bait. If the fish shows interest, if the fish tries to grab that little worm, that little tiny hook gets in, and with that little tiny hook, a person can succeed in capturing a 300 or 3,000 pound fish, you know, sometimes, whatever it is. And that's us, that's us. The Torah tells us in the case of Yosef HaTzadik, the Medrash paints such an incredible picture to what lengths Potiphar's wife, Potiphar went to seduce him, to try to break down his defenses. She wore different clothing in the morning, afternoon, and evening, and used every ruse, every trick in the book, every kind of seduction, promising him every kind of reward and goodness in the world if he would just give in a little bit <clears throat> and warned him the consequences he's going to suffer. We see what the consequences were. To be thrown in prison for 12 years, the Torah says one word, one word, Vayemo'en, and he refused. And of all the musical notes that we have in the, in the, in the trap, on the Vayemo'en, there's a Shalshelis. The Balkori, when he reads it, reads Vayemo'en three times, implying that Yosef Hatzadik knew what the Meraglim how the Meraglim would fall, how, clear, how anybody, anyone who fell, fell by the expressing a little bit of interest. The story, this goes back to the beginning of time, the story of the Eitz Adas, Odom and Chava. The snake engages Chava in a conversation and, he, and, and, and starts discuss, he's, he's discussing, he's talking, innocent, innocent talk. No problem, discussing about what, what, what did Hashem say? And how, did Hashem say you can't eat any of these trees? No, Hashem didn't say we can't eat any of these trees. Hashem said just one tree we can't eat, we can't touch it. Engaged, she engaged, she was engaged in conversation with the Nochosh. The Nochosh was able to, to put a little twist on it, Rachman son, and to swallow, to swallow her, to swallow up mankind. And the Mephoshim point out that it's the, the, the secret is in these two words, im tirze, im tirze, if you want. A, a person needs to know that this is what we are in this world for, what makes us, the whole purpose of creation, of the entire creation, was so that there would be one type of being called human beings who would be given the option of choosing to comply or refuse what Hashem wants. And if we can choose, if we can take, the, if we can want the right things, we can succeed completely. Now, 
you have a, a body and a soul. A human being, a malach is, is purely spiritual. A human being is different in that there's a body and a soul. The Hebrew word for soul, there are different terms that are used to refer to the soul. There's nefesh, ruach, neshama. These are different words that are used to mean the soul. All of them mean the soul. They refer to different parts of the soul, different levels. The word nefesh, the Torah tells us, means desire. When Avram Avinu wants to bury Sora, he says to the Bnei Ches, Im yesh es nafshechem, es mesi, if you want me to bury my, my wife, then sell me a place. So, Rab, Rabbi Nezal explains that the, that means that the neshama, the, the, the soul of a Jew, is one, is one big unit of Ratzayim. What does it want? It wants Hashem. It wants Hashem. It wants holiness. It wants mitzvahs. It wants Torah. It wants all the right things. The body comes with a person is called Adam from the word Adama, earth. We come from earth. The lowest of the lowest of the lowest of the lowest possible thing in creation is earth, Adama. The body wants different things. They're both working in two, op- pulling in opposite directions. The neshama wants more Torah, more ruchnius. The body's interests are in gashmius. <clears throat> now the question is, how did that come about? How did it come about that there's this, this conflict? If Hashem would have put us into this world without a body, <clears throat> just a soul alone, or if the body did not have those physical desires, the soul would burn up completely. Like you have a, a, a rocket ship or something like that that's on fire, where the fire gets more intense and more <coughs> intense. You, you get a machine that's hot, that gets hotter and hotter, and doesn't have a fan attached to it. A computer or some other machine, all of these machines have a fan attached to them to cool them down. Why? Because as the machine is running, it's generating heat, fire, fire, more fire, more fire, and unless there's something to cool it down, it'll burn up and self-destruct. Here also, the soul of a Jew in this world is a, is a package of rotzain, nefesh, rotzain. It wants only closeness to Hashem, kir v'aselokim. It wants ruchnius and everything. And, and Hashem wants that there should be bechira, there should be an aspect of free choice. How does Hashem make that? Hashem took part of himself Part of his rotzain, the Torah is an expression of Hashem's rotzain. Every single mitzvah <clears throat> is a display of what Hashem wants. Hashem wants us to wake up in the morning and wash negel vaser. Hashem wants us <clears throat> to light candles. Hashem wants us to put on. So the Torah, every line, every word, every letter in the Torah is an expression of rotzain Hashem. Hashem took that rotzain also and put it into food. Hashem took a part of himself, sp- holiness, sparks of holiness, which are this rotzain, and put it into food, put it into clothing, put it into all the materialistic things in this world. Now, because this item originates from Hashem, it's part of Hashem, it starts out as a very, very holy item. However, the fact that it has come down billions of levels down into this physical, materialistic world, those ritzoinos, because it's come so far down, there becomes a possibility for Tuma to attach itself to it, for the Eight Sahara to attach itself to it and pull it down. <clears throat> so that the same food, the same food, vegetables, chalk, even chocolate and ice cream, if a person is eating it, at the right time, the right amount, with the right intention. person eats anything and they make a proper bracha on it. And they eat the right amount of it. And they're eating it as a display of respect. I'm eating this to help me serve Hashem. Or I'm eating it to show respect for Torah. There's a siyam, siyam hashas that's taking place. And one of the ways that we show our respect for the Torah is that this isn't like some other book or some other project where it's finished, big deal. 
this is the biggest deal in the world, that people were zeicher to spend hundreds, thousands of hours learning Torah, and we show our respect for that fact by making a banquet, a special meal. The, the eating of the food at that time is a display of respect for Hashem. Respect for Hashem and, and rotzain of Hashem. Whereas if a person takes the same food and eats it without connecting it in any way to Hashem, where it's purely for personal pleasure or personal kavod, it's paying respect and homage to me. I like myself, and because I like myself, I like to buy a, a suit, a pair of shoes that cost $1,000 or a, whatever it is, because I enjoy it, because I like it. Or I, I want people, I want to attract attention, I want people to look up to me, I want people to respect me. That same article of clothing, that same suit or shoes or dress, if a person buys it, Lekovet Shabbos Kodesh, that I would never put, put, put this article on on a weekday. But Shabbos, which, which Hashem tells us to honor the Shabbos, not honor me, honor the Shabbos, this is my way of paying, showing respect for Shabbos by the fact that on any other day other than Shabbos, I would not wear this. And it's only out of respect for the Shabbos that I'm wearing this, or that I'm eating this. Then a person is taking the, the, the term taiva. Taiva means desires. There's a taiva for food. There's a desire for food. There's a taiva for clothing. There's a taiva for kovoid. All of these things. Taiva, another word for taiva is rotzain desire. This item, the, the taiva for food, clothing, cup, all of these things, there's a, a holy side to it and there's a flip side to it. The same exact item, if it's being, if it's being used within the parameters that Hashem defined, within the boundaries that Hashem defined, then this item is an item of holiness that brings a person closer to Hashem. The same thing, if it's taken out of those boundaries and, and it's for self-serving purpose, it becomes the exact opposite of that. And this is what happened to the Meraglim, this is what happened to Koirach, in each one of these cases, where Hashem said, <coughs> because you're doing some imtirtze, you are, I, I, I'm not, I don't want you to do, I, it's not something that I've expressed any interest in. You want, you want this for yourselves? Then the Torah says, <coughs> that Hashem says, Ani noisim lechem mot mokim litois. Now I'm going to let the leash out. Now I'm going to leave room for error. I'm going to make it very, very easy for people to misinterpret and mistake certain signs they're going to see. And the Gemara gives examples. The Miracle and Teretz Yisrael, Hashem did mir- perform miracles for them. Things Lamalim and Ateva. People, the giants were dying all over the place as a favor to the Maraglim to protect them. So people shouldn't notice them, people shouldn't take issue with them. They were busy with their own problems. They saw this and misinterpreted. Everything they ended up misinterpreting, why? Because, because they got involved in, in self-interest. The Torah tells us, the Zohar Kodesh says there were at least two problems here. One was that they knew that if the Jews come into Eretz Yisrael, they lose their status. The Maraglim, who were, who were highly respected, highly regarded in Klal Yisrael, they knew that if the Jews come into Eretz Yisrael, their positions would be, they would be replaced by others. Other people would take over the leadership of the tribes. That was one issue. And another issue was that the Zohar Kodesh says that they were on a certain plateau at that time where they were higher than Eretz Yisrael. The level of holiness that they were on was higher than Eretz Yisrael, which meant going into Eretz Yisrael was a step down, would be a step down for them. And, and they weren't willing to do that, despite the fact that Hashem was recommending it, Moshe Rabbeinu was recommending it. If Hashem says to go down, we know that there's a going down in order to go up. When a person jumps on a diving board, they press down on it. A person's jumping down, in order to go 10 levels higher than they, than they could normally. Here it was a case of Hashem, Moshe Rabbeinu, proposing, suggesting what to them would be a Yerida, which would bring about an incredible, incredible Aliyah. But because of the fact that there was self-interest, that clouded their vision. There's a Pasuk, Ki HaShoychad Ya'aver Enei Chachamim. That Shoychad, Shoychad means bribe, a bribe. Shoychad could be money, 
shechet could be kavod, honor, things that, that, that people are, are enticed with, those kind of things. That this can blind an intelligent person, ene chachamim, someone who the Torah labels intelligent. And then the Torah goes on to say that when they went, it says that Moshe Rabbeinu sent them al pi Hashem. On the word of Hashem, Hashem gave the word, Hashem gave the go-ahead. But Rashi says, bir shuso. Hashem gave them permission. He allowed them to do it. Hashem said, I'll let the leash out. I didn't tell you to do this. This isn't something that I told you to do or I asked you to do. You, pr- you, you, want, you want to do it. You want to do it? Whatever path a person wants to go on, Hashem leads them on that path. And this is the fine line. This is really, really the fine line that each one of us needs to know. And this is why Rabbi Nachman puts so much emphasis on tefillah, on his this, because it's a matter of a person. We're, we're in a world, we're on a, uh, on a uh, conveyor belt. The thing that's, I'm sorry? Treadmill. treadmill. In this world, we're, we're on a treadmill. A person gets up, where things are moving constantly around them. The, a person doesn't have a chance to really stop and think and stop and analyze. And things are coming at us all the time. And it's only if a person gets it, an opportunity to stop and think. What do I want? What do I really want? It's only if a person has a chance to do that really properly that there's a chance that they could succeed. Because again, there's two things coming at at us at the same time. There's the rot sign of Hashem that's found in the Torah and in mitzvahs and in Maisim Tovim. And there's the rot sign of Hashem that's found in food, clothing, in all of these other things. That's also the Ratzon of Hashem. The only problem is that because those things are Gashmi, because they're of a materialistic nature, it's easier for the Eight Sahara to grab hold of those and misinterpret them, or get a person to misuse it, <coughs> the same item. The same item, the, the case of Koirach, the way Rashi HaKodesh explains it. Koirach saw, he had Ruach HaKodesh. He saw ahead of him, leadership of Klal Yisrael, that Shmuel Anavi would come from him, great giant, the great kavod was destined, kavod for Hashem, was destined to come through him. So he felt if that's the case, then I am certainly worthy of kavod, nothing. And, and the truth is, he was worthy of kavod, but, but he's not supposed to ask for it. He's not supposed to ask for it, and he's not supposed to chase it in any way. The Torah says the advice for a Jew is, even though the purpose of creation was kavod, Hashem's kavod, and kavod Torah and everything, the individual, the individual is supposed to do whatever they can to move away from it, to step away from it, to see to it that I'm, I'm not... This is something Hashem Moloch Geus Lovish. It's something that belongs to Hashem. The moment a person expresses an interest in it, that they're looking for it, they want it, or the moment it's for themselves, it's not for Hashem, it's self serving, self satisfying, the same item becomes a, a traif item. <coughs> so so what, it, what it's really comes down to is this issue of Ratzain, that the decision that we need to make in, in life and in this world is. Is I want, what do I want? Is, is, there, is there what I want? Or like the Mishnah says in Perk Yehovah, is batel retzoincho mepnei retzoinoi. That the mission of a Jew in this world is to be able to take any personal retzoin, any personal desires that I have that are coming from me, not because Hashem said to, to do this or to want this, but it's coming from me to be able to negate that and eliminate that completely and, and, and assure myself that I'm only going to choose, that any time I'm choosing something, the question is, is this what Hashem wants? And here we know that, that the, the, the physical world, I'm going to close with this next point, the, the world that we're operating in is defined by three things. Mokoim, Zman, Oilam, Shona, and Nefesh. Place, time, and then the, the, the being, the being that's operating between the place and time, whether it's a rock, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal or a human being. That's the, the nefesh 
operating within Olam and Shona, within space and time. The, the Torah shows us that in, in all three of these, a person has the ability to choose something which, which will bring them closer to the Ratzon of Hashem. In place, in the world, it's a big, big world, a gigantic world. There's different countries, each one of them has their attractions. Some of them have skiing, uh, uh, you know, tall mountains to ski off. Some of them have beautiful waters to, to go to, diving in. Each one has its special things. The Torah says, Rotsiso Hashem Esartzecho. Hashem wants this land. Hashem wants Eretz Yisrael. Hashem has made it clear that out of all the different places in the world, the place where it comes most natural for a person to want the right things, to want what Hashem wants, is Eretz Yisrael. It's Eretz Yisrael, it's, it's Yerushalayim, it's the Har Habayis, it's the Beis HaMikdosh. If you look, what, what was the Mishkan constructed from? The Mishkan was constructed from all the good desires of Klal Yisrael. It says, Me'eis kol isha liboy. Each person who expressed a desire to give to Hashem, this one gave wood, this one gave copper, this one gave linen, each one. That's what the Beis Samitash, that's what, that's what holiness is comprised of. It's comprised of the Ratzayin of Hashem. And we're told that that's what Eretz Yisrael is. And, and within Eretz Yisrael, different levels of holiness, the more you get to a high level of holiness, the more you're getting to a place where you're getting closer to the Ratzayin of Hashem, to the will of Hashem, to have the ability not to be distracted, not to have it watered down by any of your own personal desires, pure Ratzayin Hashem. Time. Whenever the Torah defines any type of holiday, a day that's holier than a different day, what makes it holier? Rotzon. We make Kiddush Friday night and Shabbos morning in the Shemayin Esrei. We say that Hashem gave us the Shabbos. Bi ahava uverotzon hin chautono. Bi ahava uverotzon hin chilono. We say it in Benching. We say it in the Shemayin Esrei. I'm, I'm sorry, we say it in Kiddush, in the Shemon Esrei, that Hashem has given us this time, that this is a time when a person ha- can find it most natural and easiest to connect with the Ratzon of Hashem, to be able to put aside all the distracting Ratzonos and connect with the Ratzon of Hashem. Now the Nefesh, when we talk about the Nefesh, this is the whole concept of Tzadikim, the concept of Tzadik. A tzaddik is the person it, within the levels of creation, inanimate objects, plants, animals, humans, the, the different levels. The highest level is a human being. The highest level within human beings is a Jew. The highest level within Jew is the tzaddik. What makes him a tzaddik? What defines him a tzaddik? The ability to overcome any personal rutzon, to put aside things that a person desires, things that a person finds desirable, attractive, that are not within the Ratzon of Hashem, this person has been able to overcome all of those, negate all of those, and focus only on what Hashem wants. This is a person who, who anything he goes there, anything he does, anything he thinks, he's always asking the question first, is this what Hashem wants? And as much as even a tzaddik can achieve that during his lifetime, the Mishnah says in Pirkei Ovois, Al-Tamen bi'atzmecha ad yom moscha. Don't, don't have faith in yourself. Don't be overconfident until you pass away, until a person leaves the world. Rabbi Nachman, Rabbi Nezal once saw a tzaddik on his deathbed. He was about to pass away, and he saw the tzaddik go like this. He snapped his finger, and he said one word. He said, Ibegish bringen. I jumped over. In Yiddish, Yiddish means I jumped over. I made it. I crossed the river successfully. He was implying that he made it through this world, through all the tests that a person goes through in this life without, without getting diverted, without messing up in any way. And Rabbi Nezal said, that, that tzaddik I envy. I envy a person who's at the finish line. He's about to cross the finish line, and, he's, and he can say, Ibegish bring and I made it. Because until then, we know that there are people who are very strong, very determined. There are people who take on projects 
a diet of some sort or a mission, whatever it is, and they're able to hold it for a certain length of time and somewhere along the way they fail. And even when it, the Gemara gives an example of a tzaddik, Yochanan Kohen Gadol, who after 80 years ended up failing. So even when it comes to tzaddikim, as long as a person is in this physical world, there's still an element of, of, of doubt, an element of fear may be chas v'shon. This is one of the reasons why even Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moshe Rabbeinu was leaving Mitzrayim, he took security with him. He wasn't, he wasn't willing to rely on himself. He took a tzaddik who had passed away. He took the coffin of Yosef at tzaddik with him as security. He is secure. He's no longer living in this world. He made it. He's Ibigashpringen. He made it across. That's our battering ram. That's our guarantee that we're going to get across the Red Sea. That's our guarantee that we're going to get into Eretz Yisrael. Yoshua, the student of Moshe Rabbeinu, when it came to the Merabim, he worked his whole life to nullify, to negate himself completely to Moshe Rabbeinu. That's how he passed the test with the Merabim. Kolev ben Yefuna came into Eretz Yisrael. He made a beeline for the Maura Samach Pela to go to Kivrei Tzadikim because, again, they are the ones who made it. They're the ones who succeeded in getting through a whole life in this world where there's this competition between what Hashem wants and what I want. What Hashem wants and what the Eight Sahara wants me to want. And they succeed in getting across. These are the ones who made it. Hashem should help that we should be Zoycha to know that this is really what it comes down to. This is what it comes down to. That life in this world is all about Ratzain. Hashem is Ratzain. Hashem is the source of all Ratzain because we said the term Nefer, spirituality. Another word for spirituality is Ratzain. The Beis Hamikdash is called Ratzain. Shabbos is called Ratzain. All these things are, are called Ratzain. What it comes down to is the ability for a person to know that there are these two paths. There's the, the pure, unadulterated Ratzain of Hashem. And then there's the Ratzain of Hashem, which Hashem has placed into all kinds of material, materialistic and physical and desires, where there, there's positive and negative, there's good and bad. And there, the Sahara can use it to entice a person, where a person first says, oh, I'm going to buy this thing, you know, L'Kav Shabbos. <laughs> but then, Chas the person goes and spends much more than what they can that kind of thing, they, they cross certain boundaries, certain lines, where it's, it's not coming from a place of Yetzir Tov. It's coming because this is something that I want. And there the person has to ask themselves, this, this is the, 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 the gauge all the time, asking myself, is, is this really the rod sign of Hashem? And I want to try to do whatever I can to, to get to that. And the ones who can guide me, the, the guidance for that is in the Torah, and the true tzaddikim. They're the ones who are qualified to know what Hashem really wants. The example of the Meraglim, Korach, where the Torah calls them very high-level people, very smart. Korach is called the Pikeach. The Meraglim are called Anshe Hashem, very great people. It's not enough. It's not enough to be very smart, very learned, very great. Tzaddik. Tzaddik is one who passed certain tests. Tzaddik is one who achieved a level of purity where he is one, one with the Ratzon of Hashem. That Hashem, if Hashem says, Ratzis Hashem Artsecha, that he wants Eretz Yisrael and he wants Am Yisrael, we make a brach every day, Shabbach Arbonami Kolo Amin, that he chose us from all the nations. That Hashem should reveal his Ratzon to the world. He should show Amen. the world his love for Eretz Yisrael, Amen. his love for Klal Yisrael, his love for the Torah, and, and protect us from everything Amen. we need to be Amen. protected from, and, and eliminate all the opposition, all the enemies. Amen. to see the Gula Shleim of Amen. 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 He's really following his own rats in the whole way there. Exactly. So, so, what kind of approach? How can we possibly make it to it? Very, very powerful question. 
he's saying that, that if it, it, it's easy for a person to fool themselves sometimes into thinking, I'm doing this. There, there are books written about this where there, there are, there's a person who says, who says to, who, 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 will, who will mention, uh, who will compliment his wife. Or he'll do something. He'll actually buy his wife a present. And a person sees that and says, wow, he really loves his wife. That he went out of the way to, to, to buy such a... And somebody else says, nonsense. He told me why he bought that present. He needs her to sign on a certain document. He needs a, a certain thing from her, very, very important. <clears throat> he did it because he loves himself. He wants to buy this special car for himself, let's say, and she's been opposing it for the past five, screaming she, over my dead body. He'll never get this, never, never. But he knows she likes this thing very, very much, and he knows if he gets this for her, she'll say yes to him. So here's the, this issue that in this world, a person can, can fool other people and a person can fool themselves. That's the biggest danger in the world. How does a person know? The answer is a combination of three things. Three things. Torah, a lot of study of Torah, a lot of study of Torah. Because the Torah, the Torah like echoes to you what, what, what you're looking for. But, but even in the Torah, if I have an agenda, if I want the Torah to, to okay to approve what I want, that then the Torah is not going to be enough. Then there's tefillah, and there's tefillah. And in tefillah also, the Gemara says, a rabbi saw somebody davening, Hashem, please, let, help, let me be zeichah to marry this woman. And the rabbi went over to him and said, what are you doing? What are you doing? You don't know. Could be she's not the right one for you. And by you being mispal for it, you could get it. And it could wreak all kinds of havoc. It could cause all kinds of destruction to you and to Klal Yisrael. So even with tefillah, Torah and tefillah not enough, the third ingredient, tzaddik. Tzaddik. And, and that's what we see in these parshas. You're talking about the tzaddik as Nachman? I'm talking about the tzaddik as Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm talking about the tzaddik as Rabbi Nachman, those that learned Daf Yomi. The Gemara and Rosh Hashanah mentioned... Yiftach bedoyroi, kishmul bedoyroi. That in each generation, in each generation, there are tzaddikim who are authorized and qualified to lead that generation. And it's by the combination of, of studying what we received from Moshe Rabbeinu through the eyes of the tzaddikim of our generation. Because we are not qualified to know how to apply Moshe Rabbeinu's words to us. In each and every generation, the tzaddikim of that generation are the ones who know how to apply it in this generation, in today's times, and to me. Some, sometimes a tzaddik can tell me that for me this is permissible and for him it's for the same item. For me it's unkosher, for him it's, part, it's a mitzvah. Th those are the three minimum, minimum things that a person needs. They have to search. They have to search using the Torah and the tefillah. Those are the tools that we use to search. How does a person know what, how do you, how do you define a tzaddik? You need to learn the Torah to see how does the Torah define tzaddikim. Uh, examples, all kinds. And, and tefillah, begging Hashem that we're in an olam sheker. I know that this is, I see that 250 Roshay Sanhedrin were able to make a mistake. They had a choice, choose to follow Korach or Moshe Rabbeinu, and Korach was a better sales, he sold them. He sold them, could you imagine? Roshay Sanhedrin? That's how imperfect we are. That's how vulnerable we are. We're in an oil sheker. We're a combination of body and soul. We have a lot of things working against us. So it's only if a person really ratches up the rut sign to a very big high, to, to really, you know, the Gemara says, one of the Tanoim said, Hashem ritzoyni lasois ritzoynecha. I want to do what you want me to do. But there's this guy inside of me that's pulling in the opposite direction. Help me. Help me. The Gemara says those words that every single day the Sahara comes at a person with a new, new attack. Unless the person gets divine assistance, they cannot win. That, that we're being told that. So now how do you get the divine assistance? You have to ask. You have to beg Hashem for it. For, his, for our souls, for our wives, for our children, for all of Klal Yisrael. That Hashem should have Rahmanas on us. And, and open our eyes to be able to see what, what it's all about and to go for the right things. Amen. Amen. I have a few questions if you don't mind.
Okay. We would like to make a minute for Marif. Yeah, we would like to have Marif right now. We didn't have Marif yet. We have six at least. Yeah. 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 You said you were talking about Gadim and you only wear a certain one of Shabbos. Yes. What about food? You were talking about that. Shabbos leftovers. Can you eat those during the week? Yes, you yes, can. definitely. On the contrary, to have a, if a person is eating food leftover on Shabbos, to, to know that this is something holy, this is something special, how we right should bring the holiness into the week. And the other question I have is, why didn't Rabbeinu uh, stay in Eretz Israel? He knew, Rabbi Nelson Zahra writes about this in the Gdolochas, that there were tzaddikim that knew that their mission was to take care of their flock and food starts, number one. And number two, the, the Zerokov speaks about certain Moshe Rabbeinu, other things that have to be buried in food starts, to ensure that the Jews of Chutzlaritz will be able to be brought in at the end. They knew that that was their mission. Thank you. Thank you.